Hello, everybody. I am Jess Brown with the Iowa DNR and I want to welcome you today to our discussion and meeting here on some research we've been doing on the movement of Canada geese in Iowa, specific to some urban areas. So we'll be hearing from Oren Jones on our wildlife staff and his fellow researchers from Iowa State here in a moment. In the meantime, I just want to take a quick moment here to welcome everybody who is joining us both on Zoom and Facebook Live and just go over a few general housekeeping type of things. For those of you here on Zoom, we are running this in a webinar mode. So that means we have everybody's screens, their cameras and microphones turned off. The chat function is not available. However, we do have a Q&A box that we will have open throughout the presentation. So please feel free to drop your questions in there. And we have staff who will be watching that and helping answer. And we'll also be taking some time at the end of the session to answer some questions on screen with Orrin and Bob and Ben. We will also be taking questions from those joining us on Facebook Live. So if you're watching there, please go ahead and drop your questions in the comment section and feel free to share the video with your friends. We are also recording this webinar, so be mindful of that. And we'll be sharing that on Facebook quickly after it's wrapped up. And then also in the next few days on our YouTube channel. So it's youtube.com slash Iowa DNR. We will try our best to answer those questions for you during the presentation. If for some reason we are not able to get to them, I believe Warren will share his email address toward the end of the presentation. So go ahead and feel free to open up a conversation with him there. And if you have any other questions, please let us know in the Q&A function. Otherwise, I believe at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Oren and let him introduce his fellow researchers. And I will see all of you after the presentation. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Jesse. Good morning, everyone. I'm Oren Jones. I'm a waterfowl biologist with the Iowa DNR. And I'm joined today by my co-authors, Dr. Bob Twaver of Iowa State University, the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, and Dr. Twaver's recently graduated master's student, Ben Lukanen. Ben is now pursuing a PhD at the University of Michigan, at Michigan State University. We're going to share with you today the results of our recent Canada Goose Research Project. We're really fortunate to have conducted this work and it was a strong collaboration between the Iowa DNR and ISU. We have some interesting and exciting insights into Iowa's Canada Goose population. Okay, so when we think about Canada Geese, I think it's important to have some historical context. Canada Geese were not always as abundant as they are today. In fact, Canada geese were extirpated from the state of Iowa from 1907 through 1964. During the 1960s, the Iowa Conservation Commission, the predecessor of the DNR, began an effort to restore Canada geese. This effort resulted in the population we have today, which has been relatively stable since 2000 and is within the bounds identified by the DNR. So this has been a remarkable success story. Canada geese are a valuable member of modern day Iowa's wildlife community. They provide a lot of recreational opportunity and important ecological benefits and also aesthetic values as well. However, this remarkable um, comeback or restoration has not been without some growing pains. Perhaps most notably is the way Canada geese have learned to exploit or to live in urban areas. This was really unanticipated and unforeseen. Canada geese were thought to be um, closely associated with cattail marshes in remote areas. However, modern development is very attractive to Canada geese. The combination of um, small, bo small bodies of water with adjacent short grass is very attractive. And so these birds have learned to exploit these areas. They've proven to be 
uh, much more intelligent and much more flexible in their behavior than we, than we knew. So we know a lot about geese in rural areas, but there were some important uncertainties about geese in urban areas. And why, this is, why these uncertainties are important is because urban areas are where we now have the highest number of human goose conflicts. So it's really important that we understand what's going on there. That's where this study comes in. And we're really fortunate to have the opportunity to conduct this work. What we did was we compared movement and survival, two different metrics of Canada geese with two different groups of geese, geese in urban Iowa and geese in rural Iowa. So this allowed us to make comparisons amongst these groups and really develop a, a better understanding of what's going on with Iowa's Canada goose population. To understand goose movement, we used GPS GSM transmitters. This technology is relatively similar to a smart smartphone, except it has a solar panel so the battery can recharge. The technology worked very well. We conducted a huge amount of data, collected a huge amount of data very efficiently. We placed these GSM transmitters on adult female Canada geese. And when we captured them, we made sure they were with young. So we wanted to make sure that these adult females were successfully were, were successful nesters. We distributed transmitters around the Des Moines metropolitan area, but also in rural areas across Iowa to, com to allow for that comparison. <clears throat> what we find found was a high degree of individual variation each goose was unique. We found some geese that were highly active and their home range and their movement covered a, high, a large amount of the Des Moines metropolitan area. Other geese were relatively sedentary and their movement was as small as um, really staying pretty close to a, a modest sized pond in a housing development. So a really wide degree of variation but fortunately, we were able, we had such a strong data set that we're able to make some generalizations. What we found in terms of home range size was that urban and rural geese had relatively similar size home ranges. And we found a consistent pattern where, the, where their movements were largest, where their home ranges were largest during September and October. And then we saw this decline as we moved into winter in December and January. We did find that urban geese used habitat that was less susceptible or less available to hunters than the rural geese did. We were also able to monitor large scale movements, in this case, winter migration. We found that winter migration was closely related to uh, the winter weather severity, so snow cover and cold. We found that geese from um, throughout Iowa did make a winter migration, including urban geese. And this was one of our questions is a lot of people assume that urban geese stay in urban areas the entire, the entire year. And while that might be the case for some birds, other birds do make a winter migration. When birds did move, we found they were most likely to go to uh, northern Missouri, but we had one goose go as far as Oklahoma and other geese go as far as central and southern Illinois. We also saw a summer migration. Some of the geese that we captured with goslings the first year during that following summer, or I should say following spring, their nest was not successful. Perhaps it was predated or a weather event or something like that. We found a surprisingly high proportion of those geese that were unsuccessful in nesting made a large summer migration up to Northern Manitoba. 
And this was really interesting. We knew this was going on to some degree, but we didn't fully understand it. So it was really insightful to be able to see exactly where these geese are going and how, are they, how they are moving. They spent their summer in Northern Manitoba where they molted and then they returned in September. And sometimes their return migration was a little more circuitous and they may not have always returned to exactly where they originated from. 11 of the transmitters were harvested over two hunting seasons. 10 of those 11 were from urban geese. The majority of harvest occurred around the Des Moines metropolitan area. Although we did have one goose harvested in Manitoba and one goose harvested in rural Iowa. Harvest was most likely to occur in September. And of course that coincides with when the geese are using the widest, uh, have the widest home ranges or are moving the most. Our second source of data comes from banding. Banding is an annual activity of the Wildlife Bureau where we go out and we capture geese during the summer when they're flightless and we fit them with a small metal band. You can think of it as a, as a small metal bracelet on their leg with a unique number and a website where that can be reported. The Wildlife Bureau bans 3,500 to 4,000 geese annually. And so over 20 years, this gets to be a very robust data set. And this data set was a nice complement to, uh, to the movement data set that I just talked about. So over those 20 years, we accumulate a lot of recoveries and that's where that goose is, is subsequently found so most of the time, this is through hunters reporting that they harvested a, a banded goose, but sometimes these geese are found dead. Sometimes they're recaptured, et cetera. And so that provides really valuable information. And with this strong data set, we were able to break it up into two different groups of geese. Again, a statewide population, so kind of your typical Iowa, Canada goose and then a rural pop, or excuse me, and then an urban population. So these were, were geese banded within the city limits of Iowa's three major metropolitan areas. We then divided each of those groups into three age classes with an adult age class of birds three years of age and older, a um, half year age class, which would be goslings, geese less than one year old, and then a sub-adult class, which would kind of be uh, analogous to human teenagers, geese that are one to three years old. We see some differences in the recovery patterns of these birds with the, the sub-adults being most likely to be recovered out of state, but we also see that with adult geese as well. And that's probably related to the molt migration we discussed earlier. But most recoveries occur within the state of Iowa and most, I, most birds banded in urban areas are recovered nearby, immediately adjacent to those urban areas. This banding data allows us to estimate a survival rate, which is the probability of a bird surviving to the next year. And again, we can look at this by um, a statewide group of geese and an urban group of geese with those three age classes, adults, juveniles, which would be goslings, and then sub-adults, so the teenagers, one to three year olds. What we see is remarkably high and stable survival rates for, uh, for both adults and juveniles. We see a little bit lower survival rates for the sub-adults. And this is really insightful information. This allows us to have a much better understanding of what's going on with our Canada goose population. One really interesting insight this provides is that um, the urban geese survive and are harvested at a similar rate to our statewide population. Our hypothesis coming into the study was that the urban geese would have a, a higher survival rate and a lower harvest rate because they might, because they weren't as susceptible to harvest as rural geese, but we didn't find that to be the case. <clears throat> and
And we found that these breaking up the date, breaking up the banding data this way was really insightful and allowed us to better understand what's going on with Iowa's candidates. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ben. During Ben's time as the graduate student, he was able to monitor these geese on a daily basis and, and has some interesting observations to share with us. Go ahead, Ben. Thanks, Oren. Since Oren went through some of the more quantitative results of our research, I'd like to take a little bit of time and just talk about a few examples of goose movement and behavior that I hope everybody will find interesting. To start off, I'd like to just give a few examples of some of the more interesting adaptations to urban environments that we observed in the geese over the course of the project. These GPS transmitters not only allowed us to monitor movement during the hunting seasons, but we were also able to see um, where the geese nested. And you might have seen um, geese nest in some strange places in Des Moines. We observed them nesting along buildings, in flower pots, um, even along the, the medians of highways. But one thing that was pretty interesting to me is that a lot of the geese seem to prefer to nest on rooftops and they're really quite successful doing so. And just as an example, you can see in the picture on the left there, there's one of our geese with her nest on a rooftop. We also observed some interesting adaptations and um, some of the geese learned that they could find some novel food sources in these urban areas. The picture in the center there is some locations at a large rail yard in Des Moines. A couple of our um, birds um, flew to this rail yard repeatedly in the winter and it appeared that they were making use of spilled agricultural grains um, for feeding. So that's one example of how they found um, an interesting way to, to feed in, in these urban areas. There's a time period in the summer when geese are flightless because they're molting their feathers. And so for several weeks, they're unable to fly. And during this time, um, they seem to have no problem still navigating these urban areas. So the map on the far right shows the, the movements of a goose that we captured in the lower right-hand corner during banding operations. And then in the next several days, after we release the goose, you can see her path and she moved all the way to the pond in the upper left-hand corner, a distance of several miles. And this whole time she was flightless, so she was walking and you know, crossing roads and navigating other hazards in these urban areas. Um, again, while, while she was, she was un unable to fly. And so that's just an example of, um, again, how these geese have adapted to and are quite comfortable and successful using these urban areas. You can go to the next slide, Oren. So next, I'd like to just, just use one goose as an example of some variability in habitat use. This is a goose that we called 2C3. We were pretty surprised to see that in the early fall, it's so like in September and October, 2C3 was quite fond of roosting on building rooftops. Typically geese roost or spend the night and rest over water, but she made use of these large flat rooftops. When it came time for her to nest in the spring, she nested on the roof of a car dealership in Des Moines. And from the people who worked there, it sounded like this was an annual occurrence. And so she made you know, some interesting use of these urban areas at certain times of the year. But when she migrated in the winter, she flew to Missouri and spent all of her time in rural areas that you would typically associate with Canada geese. And she really didn't use any urban areas at all. So that's just an example of how variability and habitat use you know, changes for one individual throughout different times of the year. And as Ord mentioned earlier, we also observed quite a bit of individual variation and each goose um, was, was pretty unique um, by themselves as well. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. And so that kind of brings me to my final point in that it's really more complex than just saying that's an urban goose. These GPS transmitters allowed us to, to see just how complex the, the goose's life cycle is throughout the year and to see you know, just, just how large movements they make. As Oren mentioned earlier, we observed um, geese make a molt migration in the spring. 
And we had geese go as far as 1,800 miles straight line distance from their breeding areas in Des Moines, some going as far as the Arctic um, to spend the summer. And so I, I'd encourage you next time you observe a goose in an urban area, just think about how complex that goose's life cycle is and all the interesting things and interesting places that goose may have visited. So I think that that wraps it up for my slides, Orin. Okay, thanks, Ben. Okay, next we're gonna ha have some perspectives from Dr. Claver. Dr. Claver has a, a broad experience as a wildlife professor. Bob, uh, let me see here. Next slide, Ben. I first want to just uh, echo how you, what Oren said about the cooperative nature and how well this project worked. It was a great project between us at Iowa State and Iowa DNR, and we couldn't have done the project without the help of the management staff over the 20 years of the goose banding. As Warren said, that they have banded between 3,500 and 4,000 geese a year, and that, that was critical. And they were also critical for helping us to fit the GPS collars that Warren described. In, in the same time, we really appreciate the fact and, and the help of the hunters that reported their harvested geese. Without that, we wouldn't have been able to do the analysis that Ben described and Orrin described on the, to calculate survivorship and recoveries and movements of, of these geese. Um, you know, it's really important that the hunters, when they harvest these geese, do so in a, you know, as a unbiased manner as possible and then report that the geese that they harvest and, and all of that is really critical for us to analyze the data correctly. Go ahead, Orrin. You know, the GPS collars allowed us to attain information we couldn't have ever, ever attained otherwise. You know, the old technology, we would have been able to just look at geese and get an observation maybe once a day. Here we were able to get observations every 15 minutes. We were able to follow geese clear to the Oklahoma in the winter time or, or Missouri or Illinois. We were able to find the paths of the molt migrations up to the Arctic. And, you know, with 100 kill data, we are never able to find out where they nest. But with these, with these uh, uh, collars and technology, we're able to find actual their, their molt migration paths and the detailed paths. And the other thing is we were able to see how individually these ge geese behaved. Next slide. We also discovered several things that were really counter to our tech, uh, intuition. We thought originally that geese that were collared at Bay's Branch Wildlife Management Area and Lake Panorama would exchange, but that they really seemed to be totally separate populations and we didn't really see any movement between those. And while we saw geese moving between Sweet Marsh Wildlife Management Area and Waterloo, we did not observe geese moving into Metropolitan Des Moines from other areas. Uh, we marked the geese. So that was very interesting. Next slide. Okay. Thanks, Bob. So to, to sum everything up, we, we were very fortunate to have two complementary sets of data. And, and so what we learned was that despite these geese, despite urban geese moving a little differently than the rural geese, we found that survival and recovery rates were relatively similar. And that was, that's, that's really interesting and was not what we expected to find. What we think is going on is we think that the liberal hunting regulations around the metropolitan areas and high hunting pressure, particularly around Des Moines, may be compensating or offsetting the advantages of the urban areas. So hunters have responded to geese using urban areas, just kind of similar to 
geese have responded to that attractive environment. Uh, and, and that's really important and, and interesting. Overall, we did not find trends in survival or recovery rates over a 20 year period, despite the Canada goose hunting season becoming increasingly liberal. And so this indicates that our current harvest levels are not adversely impacting the population. So all these things are really, really important for us to know as we're thinking about Iowa's Canada goose population and um, how to manage it into the future. So our next steps will be to use this information to revise the Iowa DNR's Canada goose management plan. And so what we're gonna do is reevaluate what we're doing now and look for ways to improve our future management, whether that's our hunting season structure. So will we continue to have a special September Canada goose season around the major metropolitan areas? And are there additional ways that we can reduce hum human goose conflicts in urban areas? So with that, we'd like to conclude by saying we're really grateful for the opportunity to do this work. There was a lot of people involved with this work and it was this really strong partnership between the DNR and Iowa State University. Okay. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Oren and Dr. Claver and Ben. We have a few things that have come in. So first, Scott was wondering in terms of only studying female geese in the study, why did you choose to, to focus on female geese? Yeah, that's a good question. It gets back to the biology of geese. We wanted to make sure from a sample size and making sure that the transmitters were independent that we only marked one individual of each family unit because geese stay together as a family unit for uh, probably about 10 months of the year. So in order to make sure that our data was independent, we, we needed to make sure we only put out one transmitter per family unit. Further, Adult female geese are probably the most important goose in terms of pop population management, most sensitive in terms of um, their population dynamics. And they are also um, the geese that are most likely to come back to that location. And so by selecting nesting females, we knew that the birds that we were monitoring were likely associated with the area that we deployed the transmitter at. And again, that was really looking at this urban goose, um, looking at urban geese and particularly the geese that are most likely to cause human goose conflicts. And so we felt that was that we were better off marking adult females. Okay, and Oren, if, if you wanna take the screen share down, we can just do sort of a Q and A here thing with your mug on camera. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Jamie is wondering how the rooftop uh, goslings fed. Okay, so in most of those situations, once the geese, once the goslings have all hatched and are dry, so probably within 24 hours of hatching, the female will lead them away from the nest. And so kind of like I'm sure people have heard about wood ducks jumping out of trees, these geese really only have one way to get off the rooftop. And so they need to jump. And so, you know, the, the female would lead her geese from that rooftop down to hopefully address the area below. But that's one of the unique, unique things about an urban environment is they might be jumping onto, you know, unfriendly territory. So it's really quite remarkable, but she's going to lead them off that rooftop and they're going to go and, and, uh, find other Canada goose broods and associate on um, wetlands and short, short areas of short grass. I missed that, Jesse, you're still on mute. Yeah, it had to happen sometime, right? <laughs> Scott is wondering if there were any metrics in the study that would indicate a nocturnal shift in feeding patterns. Ooh. 
I don't, I don't think so. I don't think we saw very much nocturnal feeding at all, but I would invite Ben, Ben Lucan in. If, ben, if you saw any evidence of that, I'd be happy to hear that. No, there was very little, if any, evidence of nocturnal feeding, at least in agricultural fields. Um, it would be a little bit more difficult to tell. And it's possible that some geese were grazing on lawns in urban areas after dark but there was really not any evidence of feeding in ag fields nocturnally. We see that the geese most typically made one to two daily, daily feeding flights. And, and once it got cold, that was really constrained down to one afternoon feeding, feeding flight. Okay, and we have a question from Marcus on how many active transmitters are you still monitoring and how long do those transmitters last? The technology has been quite effective. We have transmitters out now that we initially deployed in June of 2018. I'm not going to say exactly how many transmitters we currently have out uh, because we want to protect the welfare of the birds that have those transmitters out and the integrity of the, of the current research project. So there are a handful of transmitters still out there, but I'm gonna to decline to give um, specific numbers or locations. Okay, we're still working through some of the questions here. About, Andrew is wondering about how many geese are shot during the urban season First, the first week of regular season? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. <clears throat> it's tough to tell because our monitoring of harvest is at a coarser scale than we can reliably answer that question. And remember that the, um, the special September Canada goose season is limited to a, a relatively small area compared to the entire state of the which, which is open during the first week of the hunting season. So I don't have specific numbers to answer that, but I can say that much, many more geese are harvested during the regular season than are harvested during the, the special September Canada goose season. <clears throat> now, that being said, what, I, what we do have an information on it is through banding to look at how many bands are reported during the special September Canada goose season and how many of that same group of geese are reported during the regular season. And what we see there is we see the highest proportion of bands from urban geese are recovered during that um, special September Canada goose season. So in terms of how many geese are, are harvested each day from that data, it looks like more urban geese are harvested per day during that nine day special September Canada goose season than, the, than a typical day during the, the um, statewide hunting season. So along those lines, we have a couple of questions that might fit here. Jamie is wondering if heavy hunting pressure shifts their feeding habits. And also does that equal mortality show an under harvest in the rural population? Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll handle the first one about their behavior. Um, <clears throat> waterfowl, including geese, are sensitive to disturbance, including hunting pressure. They have some really strong motivations to figure that out and to be responsive to it. And these birds are remarkably intelligent and figure that out pretty quickly. You know, what we just talked about with in an, in an earlier question was that we didn't see them feeding nocturnally, but they, these birds probably respond in other ways, whether that's utilizing um, locations where hunters are not able to access to or are um, becoming wise to hunting spreads or do things like that. So yes, they definitely are responding to hunting pressure. Um, the second part of the question, the second question was, are rural geese under harvested? 
what we see is that our level of har our harvest rates are at a level that is going to encourage a stable population, which is, which is what we want. Uh, the statewide population of Canada geese is within the objective set by the Iowa DNR. So we want to encourage that population to stay there. So um, that's how we're trying to manage our harvest was, is to encourage a stable population. I don't know that I would describe, describe rural geese as being under harvested. I think they're right about where we, where we should be. Okay, and we have some people wondering personally, Oren and Bob and Ben, do any of you hunt geese on public land? I can speak for myself, I do, yes. Yeah, I, I enjoy goose hunting on both public and private land, yep. Excellent. We also have a question from Chris about when this data will be released for public review. Well, this is, this is one way that we are releasing the data. We also have a recently published a paper on the banding data that was published in the Journal of, Fish and Wild, or Journal of Wildlife Management. We're really pleased with that. That's publicly available. Um, in time, Ben's master's thesis will eventually become public, publicly available through Iowa State University. And I think some people are wondering just now that we have this information, how are we going to use the findings? Specifically, Nicholas is wondering if any of these findings will be used to consider opening any closed Canada goose hunting zones. Sure, those are the exact kind of things that we're gonna use the information to, to consider as part of our revision of the Iowa's, uh, Iowa DNR Canada Goose Management Plan. So yeah, I think we are going to look at areas close to Canada goose hunting. How do they fit into our overall management of Canada geese? And um, the local managers and I will work together to look at the boundaries of those as well. Okay. Just looking at uh, things coming in here still. Mark would like to know if you saw any major migration movements with weather anomalies like our, our famous derecho this summer. Okay, yeah, so the derecho would have occurred in early August, if I'm correct. And so that's a time of the year where geese are just beginning to fly again. So they don't move very far. And we did not see any, any um, anomalies there. All the geese survived that event. Um, and, and it didn't seem to result in any change in their behavior. Um, we do see that geese respond to winter weather though, with their migration. That's often what causes that those large scale winter movements is they're associated with severe, um, severe cold, snow, those kind of things often shortly after those events are when geese will make a, a winter migration. So during the summer months, Oftentimes geese are, are flightless and they're not moving very much. So weather doesn't seem to affect their movement as much, but certainly during the winter, it affects their movement and their behavior. Sorry, rogue mouse. <laughs> Jamie would like to know if you've noticed mortality rates changing over the years, whether like we just talked about that being weather related or if it's population size or disease, other impacts? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And, and that's one of the things that we were really happy to be able to look at. And we took a really close look at that with that 20 year banding data set. And if you remember in those survival rates that I showed, they're remarkably stable. They're almost a flat line. So despite increasingly liberal Canada goose hunting seasons, our Canada goose survival rates appear to be relatively consistent and right where they should be. Canada geese are, are, um, have high survival rates and, and as a result are um, live a long time. So we have not seen any trends in survival rates over the 20 year period that we examined. 
And that's a good thing. So let's talk a little bit about band hunting. If we feel like if that's targeting or biasing, adding bias into our results. Um, if some hunters are targeting strictly bands, would that influence or sway our harvest numbers? And, and how are we accounting for all of that as we're going through this? Sure. So an important assumption of our banding analyses are that banded birds are representative of the population and that they're intermixing and that they're basically, what happens to a banded bird is just as likely to happen to an unbanded bird. So if hunters are targeting banded birds, that could we could introduce some form of bias into our data. Now, we don't know that that is occurring at a, at a rate high enough to bias our our banding, or excuse me, our, to bias our analyses. We do know that bands are highly motivational to hunters and that net collars in particular are highly motivational. So in the case of net collars, we don't include net collars in our survival rate analyses because we know that those birds probably have different survival rates due to maybe it's hunter selection or, or maybe it's weather factors or other things that might reduce their survival so it's not representative of the population. But banding is really the only way that we can mark, mark the population and kind of make inferences based upon those banded birds. So it is very critical that hunters report their bands, which most hunters do, but we would prefer if hunters do not target and select banded birds because it could lead to some misinterpretations. Now, if uh, a harvester legally harvests one of these collars, will we be able to provide any information to them about that bird and their travels and things like that? Sure, sure. So we do work closely with, with a hunter when they harvest a, a neck collar. Our contact information is printed on the, the, the housing of the transmitter. So we ask that the hunter contacts us and then we make arrangements to conduct a brief interview. And then we exchange the live uh, transmitter with a replica and that allows us to redeploy the live transmitter on another goose at a later date. And we do share with that hunter some generalities on that information. We try not to provide overly specific or precise information because we don't want to encourage um, further targeting of other um, marked geese that might be associating with that individual. <clears throat> See, I try not to talk over you, then I forget to unmute. So Mike would like to know if over the past, the number of bands recovered to the south have declined or if there's a difference between the urban and rural bands showing that maybe urban geese are adapting and not migrating like their rural cousins. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. The distribution, distribution of, of band recoveries over time. I don't know that it has changed. Um, I would say overall, the distribution of Canada geese has changed, but whether Iowa Canada geese are less likely to migrate now than they historically were, um, that's a complicated question. We were, the information we were able to collect with the transmitters showed about what you would expect. We saw that most geese in Northern Iowa did migrate. Central Iowa was a little more mixed um, and that's largely due to the weather and the individual choices that those birds are making. You know, as, as Ben talked about, we did see where urban birds made uh, significant migrations. That was interesting, that was good to see. 
but some did not. Some stayed in Des Moines um, almost year round. Um, some stayed in Des Moines in the winter, but made a big molt migration if their nest failed. Others migrated in the winter, but maybe didn't move very much the rest of the year. So there's a lot of individual variability there. These birds are all unique and they're making, making their own decisions, which affects their movement. And then another, another interesting um, phenomenon to go along with that question is the effect of climate change and has that shifting distributions of waterfowl. And that, that's a, a big complicated question. Um, waterfowl distributions are, are always changing over time. This isn't a static, uh, the geese. So, so it's something like a lot of natural resources that's always, that's very dynamic and, and changing across time. But in terms of specific trends, I, I don't know that there are, are specific trends one way or the other. Okay, so Jason is asking, what percentage do you think of the Iowa goose harvest is from resident birds? So around Iowa, Southern Minnesota, and what percentage do you think are coming from true migrators that our map showed were up around Hudson Bay and deep into Canada? Sure, I was just looking at this. From banding data, what we find is that about um, 55 to 60% of all Canada goose bands recovered in Iowa are from geese that originated in Iowa. Another 25% are from um, geese that are coming from Minnesota. Another 10% are coming from geese that originate in the central flyway, so North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska. And then the remainder are coming from interior breeding geese, such as um, what historically is known as Eastern Prairie population. So those would be the, the um, Canada geese that nest along the Western shores of Hudson Bay. And then a very small percentage is made up of cackling geese, a, a goose that nests in the, in the art, high Arctic. Okay, and then we have a few questions in terms of how hunting seasons are affecting things. So once seasons have closed, do the transmitters show more movement, like maybe back to like an autumn pattern? Uh, Mike is asking. Well, of course, their behavior does change, um, and they are very they are responsive to hunting seasons. But I wouldn't describe it as moving back to autumn because at that time of the year, the, the geese are in spring mode. So they're, they're thinking nesting. Remember, these are adult birds. They're gonna return and try to establish a territory and defend that territory. So their behavior is just different, I would say. Um, but I do think, I mean, we do see where they, um, they respond to hunting and hunting pressure. They are, they are sensitive to that. Okay, so along those lines, uh, Chris is asking if there were, wouldn't more bands be harvested during the special Canada goose season in urban areas? Is that due to early September being the first season and there aren't any birds shot to that day? Or are the birds still keeping in their family groups at that time? Well, what, one thing we do know about geese is that um, they are susceptible, they're probably most susceptible to hunting in September. And that, that is exactly like, like Chris mentioned, because they are in their family units and closely associated with, with their nat natal area, so where they were raised. And as the fall goes on, that, that behavior generally shifts. And as our data showed, they, they, their habitat um, excuse me, their home range size decreases and their movement patterns shift and they get into bigger flocks. So it's, it's a little bit of both. I think I would just generally say that geese, Canada geese are most susceptible to harvest during the month of September. Okay, and then speaking of those larger flocks, Nathaniel's asking if the large numbers of them in refuges 
impacts that greater health of the flock. And, you know, are refuges the right so solution for dealing with geese populations of that large size? Waterfowl evolved to be gregarious in the winter. They, you know, they have evolved from the, their natural um, behavior is to be relatively, to, to be into pairs in the spring and then um, raise their broods in the summer. And then during the fall, as they migrate south, they get into larger congregations. Generally, I think refuges, refuges are generally a good thing. Um, geese are very sensitive to disturbance and they need to have a refuge or at, at the very least a secure roost. Um, that's probably a major limitation in the modern Iowa day, Iowa, modern day Iowa landscape. We're probably limited by the number of refuges or sanctuaries or secure roost sites for these geese. I think it's, it's good anytime we can keep these geese out of urban areas. As I mentioned earlier, that's where we have our most human induced conflict. So if we can have refuges or, or areas outside of cities where we encourage geese to go, that's a good thing. In terms of having too many geese at any one site, there can be downsides to that in terms of disease such as avian cholera, but that's relatively limited. It's often associated with snow geese during the spring migration. Um, I would say as a whole, I think refuges are good and it's good to have concentrations of geese outside of urban areas. Okay, and I am glancing at the time here and it's about five minutes out from our scheduled time. So we'll try to wrap some of these questions up here, but get to the last three or four that I have. And again, if you do have questions afterward, please feel free to reach out to us through Facebook or or email and we can help answer those. So to get to our last few here, Jamie is wondering, considering what we found in this study, some of the most effective methods for repelling geese from an area. Okay, that's, that's really situationally dependent and based on like, and, and depends on time of the year as well. So, in the fall, when geese are congregated together, you know, one of the best ways to keep geese away is through um, where, where legally and ethically appropriate is through hunting. Um, if that's not appropriate, certainly making the area less attractive to geese, whether that's through changes in landscaping, whether it's through hazing the geese. Um, that's probably appropriate in the fall winter and early spring, but then once geese begin nesting, you need to be careful not to overly disturb the geese on the nest. And then remember in the summer, these geese are flightless and they're raising their young. So these brood, big brood flocks, oftentimes some low fencing can be uh, a very effective barrier. Okay, Randy is asking if the data that we found here will influence dishes, decisions in any way to change the two bird limit. That's certainly something we're able to look at. And this, this data provides us with a lot of really robust information to adequately assess and to make that decision. Okay, great. Nathaniel is wondering if the brood on the rooftop from the study was able to survive? I think so. Ben, you can jump in here and correct me, but I, I think they were able to, to, to jump off, and at least in some years, in some cases. Yeah, I, I guess there were several. Um, you know, it was pretty common for geese to nest on the rooftops. Um, I think one of the pictures there was um, that I had in my slides, there was kind of a ledge around the edge of the roof, and I think um, one year they definitely got off and then I think we had talked to the, to the people who worked in that building and I think a year before we started our study they had to help the the, the brood off so you know it kind of varies but um, generally from what we saw with the data yeah I mean they're, they're, they're nesting there for a reason and generally they're successful doing so. 
Okay, I think we will wrap this up here with one last question. And again, if you're catching this later or we didn't get to something you'd ask, please uh, reach out to us on social media or through email. So the last question is a great question on how people can get involved. Ben wants to know if there's a way to be able to help band geese on, as a volunteer. Okay, yeah, well, a really important citizen sci scientist aspect is actually through hunters reporting their bands. So that's, that's, that's a, a very important um, way for citizens to be involved. Local wildlife biologists occasionally do um, incorporate volunteers into their Canada goose banding. Goose banding occurs in uh, late June and early July. So you, you'd want to contact your local wildlife biologist. They're responsible for coordinating uh, crews in their area. Okay, well, thank you everybody that's joined us today through Zoom or Facebook Live. Oren, uh, Ben, Dr. Claver, if anybody has some parting thoughts, I'll let you take a chance to share those now. Well, I would just say we're very fortunate to have been able to collect this information. It, the project went very well, and um, it's going to be very useful to help us and to manage Iowa's future Canada goose population. Yeah, I agree, Oren. I just would like to say a big thanks to all the hunters who reported their bands. Without you, we wouldn't have this great big data set to work with for the survival analysis. So you can you can pat yourselves on the back for that and. Thanks for being a great part of citizen science and, and you know, a vital part of that part of the research. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to share the results of, so the general public can get a better idea of what we do here at Iowa State and at the Iowa Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. And what a great crew that we've had to work together on this project. Thank you very much. Okay. With that, we'll wrap things up and thank you everybody for watching. Have a good rest of your day.